about some work that I've um, been doing recently on aspen leaf miners and the thermal ecology of, of small insects on, on aspens, but I want to frame that in the context of a, a sort of larger set of ideas that I've been grappling with for, for much of my career, and that is to think about uh, microclimates and how microclimates differ from the macroclimates that everyone is, is so concerned with. Um, so I want to start by figuring out how to advance the slides. Um, so I want to start out in maybe what is now a uh, now fairly standard way of, of introducing talks about, about temperature. And that is to point out the reality of, of climate change, the ongoing problem of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So these are different IPCC scenarios um, that range from, from really bad, this RCP 8.5, which um, tries to estimate future carbon emissions based on a scenario of not much global action or national action to try to stem uh, carbon emissions from uh, economic activity to RCP 2.6, which is a kind of best case scenario. That is the, the world gets its act together, um, very rapidly decarbonizes the economy and emits much less carbon over the next 80 or 100 years than in these other scenarios. And um, these, these carbon emission scenarios, of course, are associated with different estimated levels of warming by the year 2100 from you know, some warming in this very modest scenario to shocking amounts of warming in RCP 8.5. I mean, this would just be catastrophic for so many parts of the world and so many, so many ecosystems. Um, and, and this, of course, doesn't even take into account the effects of carbon on uh, pH of aquatic and marine systems. Um, and we all know that, that marine acidification is also a, a really big deal here. So, um, of course, this increasing amounts of carbon in the atmosphere are driving changes in temperature. And um, here are some estimates for future distributions of, of temperature on the earth in relation to current temperatures. And so under RCP 2.6, we expect increases in temperature in most parts of the globe and even more at especially high north uh, latitudes. Under the RCP 8.5, we expect really massive changes in, in temperature increases everywhere in the globe and the most pronounced changes at high temperate and high polar latitudes, and then also um, at very far southern latitudes. This, we also expect big changes in uh, patterns of cloud cover and patterns of precipitation. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about those in this talk, but I, I personally think that those are also going to be vastly important for um, the, the ecology of different eco ecosystems. Um, so that slide that I just showed is about long term means uh, in different places, but we, of course, know that that climate change is also driving a uh, higher frequency of extreme events. And we just got in the news in the last few days. Um, reports of extremely high temperatures in both the, the, the South Pole and uh, areas of the Arctic. Here's another example of this from a few years ago in 2016. This is the uh, February warmth baking Alaska. The Arctic was 18 degrees Fahrenheit and above normal. And so in the same way that the means are changing at high latitudes, sometimes these extremes are also hitting at uh, very high, high latitudes. And um, for biologists, of course, the, the concern and the interest is in understanding uh, which species are going to be affected by these changes and what the magnitude of those shifts are going to be. And I'm just putting up here uh, a paper that probably many of you know. This is a, a famous paper from 1999 in Nature by Camille Parmesan and a set of authors who combed through museum records of where insects were distributed over the last century and could see quite clearly a signature of northward shifts in many of these ectothermic species um, in, in the northern hemisphere. And here's, here's just one example of a British butterfly that in the early part of the 1900s was re restricted to southern England and then uh, as the century progressed, you saw populations appearing in more northern areas. And so in this period, 1970 to, to 2000, you have 
um, a much broader distribution of these in very far northern parts of, of UK. And, and that reflects that um, that there's there's been significant warming and that has allowed these populations to expand into northern areas that were formerly too cold. So um, one sort of interesting question about all of this is where in the world do we expect the biological changes to be greatest? And I would say a, a decent sort of default expectation is the biological changes should occur most where the temperature changes are the greatest. In other words, we would expect the biological changes to be greatest at the highest north and highest south latitudes. But there's been a lot of interesting discussion of this, this question over the last couple of decades and um, a sort of emerging consensus is that actually it's the inverse that we expect greater changes uh, in tropical areas in part because just this naive expectation doesn't take into account the actual evolved thermal physiology of ectotherms. And here's, here's how this argument goes in practice. This was articulated really well by Josh Tewksbury and a set of colleagues in 2008. And what they observed is that at high latitudes, ectotherms often have very broad thermal performance curves and often their operating temperatures are very low. And so if you were to get even quite significant warming, essentially what you're doing is you're pushing those organisms up this exponential left side of their performance curve so that they're actually performing better, doing things faster. The warming helps them because it's releasing them from the constraint, the cold constraints that they normally live under. Whereas, uh, Organisms at low latitudes often are thermal specialists. They have narrow thermal performance curves, and they're all um, also much more often operating near their optimal temperatures or even close to their upper critical temperatures. And in this case, even just a small amount of warming may be damaging because it pushes them closer to this, this thermal cliff. And this, this, this idea was, was put together with a bunch of climatic data in this quite famous paper by Curtis Deutsch and colleagues in 2008 that um, was published in PNAS. Um, they used a bunch of published thermal performance curves for insects that came from different latitudes uh, on the Earth and then put those together with gridded climate data on, on air temperatures and could essentially show that um, because of the narrow thermal performance curves of tropical insects, that, that in fact this expectation bears out in this modeling context that, that we expect fitness to decline the most in areas of the tropics and least, and, and sometimes you get quite positive effects on fitness at the high latitudes because the insects are, are warming up and able to perform better. Okay, I'm gonna spend the next few minutes sort of tearing down um, one sort of key pillar of, of this argument. And I wanna, I wanna just show you a quote that sets up where, where I'm going in fairly stark detail. Um, so I would say that, that the essential assumption of these modeling efforts and of most of the ways that people think about insects interacting with climate is that the temperature of the insects is equivalent to the temperature of and here's a, a representative quote from a paper by Lauren Buckley, uh, whose work I love, and I, I, I'm friends and colleagues with Lauren, and I, I think she does fantastic work, but I think she's, she's wrong about this statement in a really profound way that it's important. We assume that body temperatures are equal to air temperatures, which is reasonable for small insects, but not larger ectotherms. So I'm gonna, push back against this, this idea by setting up uh, what I'm going to call three general rules. So the first rule is that um, surface temperatures do not equal air temperatures, and that's especially true when the sun is shining. And here's a couple of examples that, that illustrate that. So the first one is a, a really lovely 2015 paper out of Michael Gaspari's lab. Um, 
they've been quite interested in the thermal ecology of tropical ants, and um, they worked at sites in Panama to try to understand the ant communities and all of the thermal experiences that those, those ant species are, are having. And they showed a really interesting thing by making a bunch of measurements of air temperature in blue, surface temperatures in red, and these are the surfaces of, of trunks, of tree limbs, of rocks, the ground, the places where the ants are walking around. And they did that for uh, areas high up in the canopy and then in the more shaded understory. And what you see is that the ambient air temperatures uh, occur in a fairly narrow band between about 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. But the surface temperatures um, sometimes go much, much higher than that, sometimes in excess of 45 or even 50 degrees. Um, and, and you know, of course, that that's just super hot, right? That's like almost painful to the touch. And they, in a series of laboratory assays, measured the critical thermal maximum. That's the temperature at which performance of an ant goes to zero when it gets too hot. And those are shown in green. And so very clearly, the critical thermal maximum match the surface temperatures much more closely than they do air temperatures. And that's probably because for an ant walking around on the surface, the temperature of the air a few meters away is almost irrelevant. Like it's experiencing something that's much more local and much hotter uh, as it's walking over those, those hot surfaces. Uh, another similar example, um, and this is taken from a paper that I wrote uh, a couple of years ago with my French colleague, Sylvain Pinsbord, a longtime collaborator. Uh, he and I have thought about these issues, this microclimate issues for a long time. And um, we redrew this uh, relatively famous figure from a Dutch scientist named Stoutjes Ditch. It was published in 1977 from measurements that he made in the Netherlands in 1976. Um, so this is a, a spring day. Um, the sun is relatively intense. So it's a clear, a clear day. And he just went around with a thermometer and measured um, the temperatures of different areas in this complex landscape. And he got temperatures that were as low as minus two degrees Celsius. But then some of the exposed areas, like this stump, were as high as 48 degrees Celsius and 45 on this tree trunk but then in the shade of the same tree, you know, four and eight degrees Celsius. These numbers here are um, at, at four centimeters below the surface of the, the ground. So um, the basic conclusion is this extreme, extreme temperature diversity at very small scales, scales that are relevant to insects. Here's a, a companion set of pictures that uh, Sylvain took in an oak forest near Tour, where he works um, using a thermal imaging camera. And this is the, the visual frame. You can see the leaf litter underneath the oaks. There's the shade of the oak trunks and then these illuminated leaves and just kind of shockingly high amounts of thermal variation. So in the shade, it's like down to nine or 10 degrees. And in the sunny place, it's you know, excess of two to 24 degrees Celsius. So, that they can, they can stand. Okay, um, so rule number two is going to be just a slightly more nuanced argument about the coupling between insect temperatures and the surface temperatures that they're around on. And so the assertion is that smaller insects match the surface temperatures, uh, match their surface temperatures more closely. And again, just a couple of examples. Um, both of these are from my work. Uh, up until about six or eight years ago, I worked quite a bit on this species of hawk moth in southeastern Arizona, in the Duca Sexta. And a series of pictures shows the life cycle. The females fly around, they find their favorite host plant, which is Datura radii. They lay eggs on those leaves. The eggs hatch out into little caterpillars, which very rapidly grow into large caterpillars that then crawl underground and make a pupa. And then the pupa some months or even the next year uh, comes out of the ground as, an, as a new adult. So uh, 
Yeah, a little more than 10 years ago, um, Kristen Potter, who was then a graduate student, Gagi Davidowitz at the University of Arizona, um, and, and me, we worked collaboratively on trying to understand the thermal physiology of eggs and, and caterpillars of Manduka, Datura. And um, Kristen did this really lovely set of uh, observations by putting out thermocouples on leaves of Datura, large leaves and small leaves, and also measuring the air temperature uh, during the active period of, of Manduka. In, this is in the Santa Rita Mountains in uh, very far southern Arizona. And what, what you see is that the air temperatures got really hot, right, in excess of 40 degrees on average among different leaves. Um, and the leaves themselves are significantly uh, cooler. So large leaves are cooler by several degrees, small leaves are, are even cooler still. And what that reflects is and I'm seeing some chat here. Is there some problem? Let's see, we okay on chat? Okay, I'll assume we're all right. Um, the, the, the leaves themselves are transpiring water so fast that they're effectively air conditioning themselves. They're cooling themselves below air temperature. And, and that's um, providing some thermal uh, safety margin for the leaves themselves, and it's also protecting the eggs and the caterpillars from the, the brunt of the high desert temperatures in which they live. Datura is unusual. It can do this because uh, unlike most desert plants, it does transpire very rapidly, which it can achieve because it, it has very deep roots that can tap sort of old water very deep below, below the desert surface. Um, so, uh, Here's a, a set of thermal images that, that illustrate the size dependence of the thermal experience of Manduka. So this is with a thermal imaging camera that shows, I'm uh, having a hard time with my, there it is. Um, so these two little dots are eggs of Manduka and you can barely see them because they're the same, essentially the same temperature as the surrounding leaf tissue. Here's a first instar caterpillar that just recently hatched, uh, hanging onto a vein, and it too is a very similar temperature to the, the leaf. But once the caterpillars start to grow large enough that they project significantly away from the leaves, this is a third instar and a fifth instar, they, their temperatures are much hotter than the leaf surface. And, and that's because they've essentially grown out of the cool boundary layer that's right against the leaf and they're integrating conditions broader spatial scales and air the surrounding the air surrounding these plants is much warmer than the leaves themselves and so so are the caterpillars. Um, just just one more example. This is a, a different system that uh, Sylvan and Michael Dillon, who's at the University of Wyoming and I worked on at the University of Wyoming biological station at Jackson Hole. So this is Jackson Lake giant field of um, uh, arrowleaf balsam root, which is one of my favorite plants. It's about to start blooming uh, all across Montana, uh, beautiful yellow flowers. And uh, we did a bunch of thermal ecology, just looking at, at leaf temperatures and, and the, the temperatures of insects, um, insect communities that are recurring in those species. And here's the kind of thing we found. So these are body temperatures of, of insects that occurred on arrowleaf balsam root. And of course, there's there's a broad positive correlation so that uh, body temperatures are mostly the same as leaf temperatures, but there's these excursions above by the insects themselves. And it turns out that we can explain much of the variation in those excursions by using the body size of the insects. So how far away they project from the leaf surface. And if they, they barely project at all, then there's almost no difference between their body temperature and leaf temperature. But then once they get above about two or three millimeters in height, then um, their body temperatures can be really significantly higher than, than the leaf temperature by five or six or sometimes up to you know, more than 10 degrees here. So again, the, the coupling between the insects and their surface temperatures depends on size and the smaller they are, the stronger that, that coupling. 
Okay, last rule is that insects themselves often construct their own thermal experiences using their extended types. Uh, here's an example that we've worked on in West Central Montana. Uh, these are tent caterpillars in the genus Malacosoma. And, you know, a lot of people view these as a drag. They're pests on, you know, trees in their yard that people like. And so people generally detest these, um, these caterpillars, but they're super interesting and beautiful in their own way. So this is a group of, of siblings that all hatched out at about the same time. And they've collectively built this tent, which is a silk structure. So every day, each of the caterpillars spends some time. Uh, so something keeps going in and out. Can, can somebody let me know what the problem is? Paige, are you there? All right, I'm gonna keep going, but I keep seeing text that somebody's having a problem with, uh, with audio. Um, okay, uh, I'll just keep going. And I'll, I'll apologize if there's audio problems happening here. Um, so these, these siblings collectively build this silk structure and then they spend, uh, they spend a lot of time on the surface. Um, and so my, my student, Victoria Dahlhoff, did a master's a few years ago, worked on the thermal ecology of these. This is a, a, a view further away of a tent and a bunch of sibling caterpillars that are all oriented on the surface. And they typically build these structures so that the flat surface of the tent is oriented toward the sun, at the noonday sun, and it Mark? acts as, yeah? Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think your internet connection might be a little fuzzy. We You kind of keep cutting in and out for us. Uh, what a drag. I know. Um, how, how bad is it? Like bad enough that you can't follow? Um, we've missed a few slides. Uh, the last slide we ended off on, was the slide with the three rules and you were presenting the third rule. Um, well, I don't know what to do because let me, let me check my internet. I'm connected through Edurome and it looks like it's fine on my end. Um, well, I'm not sure what to do. Should I like log out and log back in? Um, I am not sure. Michelle asks if you're on Wi-Fi or Ethernet. I don't know if that makes a difference. I mean, I'm I'm on Wi-Fi. I have no way to hardwire at the moment. Okay. Um, but it should be fine. Okay. Um, how about we'll just let you keep going and. If you could keep your eyes on the chat, I'll message yeah. if you cut out. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Sounds great. And you could also try turning your camera off. That seems to help sometimes. Okay, don't hear my, don't. Ugh. Yes. I'm not sure how to turn my video off. Um, oh, it might be hard because you're in presentation mode. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's pretty much impossible when you are in presentation mode. So if you want to just keep continue on and. Um, okay. Okay, I'll I'll keep going. okay, thanks. So uh, just just not to spend too much time here. Um, the the point is that. Um, these structures that insect build, the insects build often have these super important effects on the temperatures that they experience. Um, so these are, are data that Victoria collected uh, of tents, uh, tent caterpillar surfaces. 
So she put thermocouples on the tents and then measured their, their temperatures over the course of several days. And what she found was that, not surprisingly, the tent temperature and the air temperature were very similar at night. But during the day, you get these big positive excursions of, of the, the temperature. And that's because the sun is shining on the surface and warming everything up. And, and these are just amazing excursions, right? They're like 10 to 15 degrees higher than air temperature. And, and we think that this is a really key thing for allowing these early spring insects in Montana to escape the cold and to, to warm up enough to get feeding and growth to go really fast. Um, here's a, uh, another paper that's examined this idea of insects engineering their own thermal environments, and then that feeding back onto their uh, thermal physiology. So this is, again, a paper by Sylvain Pinsport and his former PhD advisor, Jerome Cassas in, in France, and they're working on insects that attack apple leaves. And what they show is that some insects cause stomatal transpiration to increase. So they cause the stomata to open up and that lowers the leaf temperature because they're evaporating faster. Other insects um, cause the stomata to close, or they damage them so that they're permanently closed, and those cause the leaf temperatures to rise. And what they showed is that the upper lethal limits of the insects actually match their effects on the leaf stomata. Those that cause the stomata to close have the highest thermal limits because they also are experiencing the hottest temperatures on, on the apple leaves. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is take those general rules and apply them to quite, quite rapidly here, so we have plenty of time for questions. Apply them to my system in the Sealy Swan Valley in Montana. I've been working on aspens and aspen leaf miners. Um, you probably have seen these on aspen leaves. Um, so the miners make these silvery mines. Um, what happens is early in the spring, the females lay eggs on aspen leaves just as they're flushing. And the eggs basically sink into the, the new leaf tissue and the larvae hatch out and they start eating and they make a mine. This is where this, this egg was laid right here. They make a mine and they progress through the leaf as they eat. And eventually they start leaving behind a line of, of frass or caterpillar poop. And then when the caterpillar gets to the very end of its growth phase, um, here it's about the size of a Drosophila larva. It's about a milligram. It, it moves to the margin of the leaf and it will make a little pupation chamber by using silk to fold this, this leaf margin over itself, and then it'll pupate there and spend like another month doing, doing metamorphosis. Um, these insects, although they're small, can be really important for aspens when they occur at high densities. Um, some of the best examples of this are from Diane Wagner's work in Alaska. She studied them during some big outbreaks in which you know most leaves on most trees were uh, mined by caterpillars, and they did this really nice experiment to show the effect of caterpillars on aspen growth by applying insecticides to knock back the leaf miners on experimental trees while not knocking them back on control trees. And what they find is that, that when you reduce the miner density with insecticides, the trees grow better. So that, that's showing this kind of at least short-term effect on tree fitness. Okay, I'm going to apply these rules to this site in the Sealy Swan Valley where I've been working for the last four years. Uh, it's, it's a MPG property. Uh, MPG is a local conservation group here in Missoula that owns a, a big ranch in the Bitterroot Valley and then a much smaller, about 200 acre ranch, uh, conservation ranch in the Sealy Swan. Um, and there's a lot of aspens there. I'm going to ask these following questions. So how much thermal diversity do aspen canopies generate and what's the importance of solar radiation? I just, just made a big deal of solar radiation, but I see if that's also true for aspen canopies. 
Um, do leaf miners construct their own thermal experience via their mines? Um, what's the thermal performance curve of leaf miners? What are their thermal limits? And then can we put all of this information together to predict what's going to happen to leaf miners as climates change in Tana? Okay, so let's take the first one. So how much thermal diversity do aspen canopies generate? We, we measured this by putting out lots of thermocouples on aspen leaves, uh, attached them to little data loggers. This is my, my former student, James Frakes, when he was a, a field technician for me. And we did a, an experiment where we had pairs of leaves that were either shaded or not during the day. This is to assess the importance of incoming solar radiation. And here's a sort of typical trace on the upper panel. Um, the, the gray line is the uh, shaded leaf in a pair, and the orange line is the unshaded leaf in a pair. And an unshaded doesn't mean like it's it's always being hit by solar radiation. It just means that I don't have that big shade in front of it. And so it's subject to the sort of normal fluctuations in all of the conditions. And, and what you see is that the unshaded leaf um, has these sort of brief excursions that are maybe five or eight degrees above the temperature of the shaded leaf. But uh, they're not super systematic. And during much of the 24 hour period, they're actually very similar in, in temperature. It's just a few moments during the day when you get these, these big increases in, in the, the unshaded leaf temperature. This, this shows a, a sort of summary of all of the data um, in terms of statistical densities. So this is like a, a histogram of leaf temperatures for the shaded ones in gray and black and the unshaded ones in, in orange. And, you know, to, to me, I was surprised that these were so similar. And what you see is that there's this kind of slight rightward shift in these densities in the sunny leaves. And that reflects these sort of extra excursions by, by those leaves to, to somewhat higher temperatures. Um, in terms of just explaining overall the patterns of variation, we saw massive amounts of variation in the Aspen canopy. This is leaf temperature as a function of air temperature. But it was actually, we had a lot of other kind of weather station type data, you know, speed, characteristics of the incoming solar radiation. And, and it was actually quite difficult to predict leaf temperatures from those other factors, much, much harder than I thought it was going to be. And I think that reflects just the complexity, the physical complexity of Aspen canopies such that you know, leaves are twisting in the wind. They're often shaded by nearby leaves or other um, uh, limbs or twigs. Uh, it's just a, it's a highly, highly complex physical environment um, that has lots of factors that are hard to keep track of that affect this, this thing that we care about. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of diversity. The sun matters, but it's hard to predict uh, quantitatively um, what the, the temperature of a particular leaf is going to be at a particular time. Okay, what about this idea that um, the insect herbivores themselves are constructing their own experience? Um, I was inspired here by some, some older work by uh, Pinsport and Casas. This is uh, some work that, that Sylvan did during his dissertation. He constructed a, a complete heat budget of uh, apple leaf miners in apple leaves. And so he's accounting for all of the components of the heat budget and then ended up measuring them. And they could predict that these, these larvae would be, you know, four or five degrees warmer than the surrounding leaf tissue on a sunny day. We, we didn't have all the information we needed to do a, a complete modeling effort, but we did just go out and brute force empirically measure uh, how much warmer are the mines than the unmined tissues? Um, we did this using a thermal imaging camera. And the answer is that the mines are warmer. Um, and how much warmer depends on whether the leaves are in the sun or in the shade. So they're about half a degree warmer when they're in uh, the shade and about 1.5 degrees warmer when they're in the sun. That probably reflects that these are acting as like little greenhouses 
and also that the larvae might have disturbed the, the stomatal function of, of the mind parts of the tissue. So yes, yes, it's modest. Um, at what temperatures do leaf miners perform best and what are their thermal limits? Um, so here we wanna construct the thermal performance curve for leaf miners. And that involves assessing the shape of this curve, trying to identify the temperatures at which they perform best and fastest, and then identifying temperature limits, although we're not gonna identify lower limits, we're gonna focus on these upper limits of CT max, that's where performance goes to zero, and then the upper lethal temperature, which typically is a little bit warmer than the temperature that, at which activity ceases. Okay. Um, to, to do this, um, it turns out to be quite tricky to measure growth in small leaf miners, and that's because we actually could not do the, the normal method, which is to weigh them uh, once and then weigh them again at a later time. And that's because you can't take these leaf mining caterpillars out of their mines, weigh them, and then put them back in. It just, it just doesn't work. They always die. And so we developed an alternative way of measuring this, we developed essentially a calibration curve that related larval mass to the mine area. So we can take a photo of a mine, trace around it to extract its area, and then from the area predict the larval mass. So to get growth rate, we just take pictures at two successive times, estimate larval mass, and then divide So we did uh, a couple of different kinds of measurements. Um, one was a laboratory experiment where we brought mines back to uh, Missoula, and held the mines in fixed temperature incubators at different temperatures for some amounts of time and measured growth rates of the larvae. What I'm showing is the, the, the black dots of the raw data, which were, were quite sobering when we, when we got them because there's so much variation and there were so many larvae that didn't grow very much or at all. And I, I initially kind of thought this was a bust, this experiment, um, but then we ended up doing something really kind of cool with the data. Um, I think most of these uh, no growth measurements represent larvae that were molting. So they were molting from one instar to the next. And um, in talking with one of my collaborators in this project, a uh, uh, postdoc, with Joel King Sovereign named Jeff Legault. Uh, he's a modeling wizard and he said, oh, you know, we can actually model this effect of having larvae in two different states, either feeding and growing or molting and not growing. And we can model transitions between those, those two states using a kind of multi-state approach. And that's what he did to model these data. Um, and what, what these green sort of violin plots show are his model fit to the raw data. And then once we had the model fit, we could say, we could ask the model, okay, well, what if all of the caterpillars were feeding and growing and none of them were molting and, and immobile? And the answer is you would expect the distributions here in red. So, so that's, that's our estimate of the sort of non-molting thermal performance of these larvae. And what you can see is a broad optimum, maybe around 20, uh, 28 to 35 or so. And then it crashes down pretty fast. It doesn't get to zero, but it looks like um, growth is gonna go to zero somewhere between maybe 30, 38 and 40 degrees. Um, we also measured growth rate in the wild and maybe for the interest of time, I won't spend much on this slide, except to say that there was really no difference in growth rate between the sunny leaves and the experimentally shaded leaves. And we think that again, reflects the, the complexity of um, these, these aspen canopies and the very brief excursions to, to high temperatures. Okay, we also measured the upper lethal temperatures and we did that uh, in a neat way in the field using some custom devices that we had built by a, a, a Flathead Lake called the Sensor Space Crew. This is a um, box on the left is a battery and a small Arduino computer. And those control 
this device on the right, which we can clamp over aspen leaves in the field. And um, we set a temperature in this box, and then the computer and the battery hold the temperature using a, a heater strip for however long you want. And so we exposed larvae in the leaves to heat shocks for an hour, different levels of heat shock, and then measured whether they lived or died. And here's the, the, the data. So uh, there's sort of two ways of looking at this. Um, so th this is the, the logged mean temperature inside those boxes and whether or not they lived or died. And the, the highest temperature that any larva survived was about 43 degrees. If you fit a logis logistic regression to this, um, the LT50, which is the temperature that kills 50% of the larvae, is 42 degrees. So we think it's reasonable to say that the upper lethal temperature is like between 42 and, and 43. Okay, last thing. How will climate change alter the performance of leaf miners in the future? Um, so there's just sort of maybe two broad things to say here. One is that look, look at the temperatures that we actually measured uh, on the leaves compared to those temperatures I just showed you for the optimal temperature and the upper lethal temperature. This, so this, this is for a single experiment in the month of May, and the temperatures are quite low, right? So the leaf temperatures are between about 15 and up to 30, with just a few that are a little bit warmer than that. And so that implies that, that climate warming may actually accelerate the laurel feeding and growth without really incurring that much risk. The problem is that this is only just a, like a single two week period in a single May uh, in, in one year. And so what we did was to try to get a much more comprehensive view of thermal risks is we, we modeled leaf temperatures on top of um, weather station data from these sites going back about 20 years. And it's a, st a statistical approach in which we, we use these observed levels of variation in leaf temperature and then, and then essentially map those onto these weather station data to get leaf uh, distribution data over 20 years. And then we could ask, how often do individual leaves go above the thresholds that start to damage the larvae? How, how often do they go above CT max or the upper lethal temperature? And here's that modeling output for shade leaves on the left and sun leaves on the right. And um, this is showing whether they exceed CT max or exceed the upper lethal temperature, which is a little higher, right? It's between 42 and 43. And um, we did that for the actual observed uh, temperature traces during the main larval growth period, which is in May and into early June. And then for this additional period that goes all the way through the end of July. And that's because that's also when the pupae are on the leaves. And we did that for the actual data traces and then what we're calling the warmed, the, the future climate change trace where we add three degrees to all of the, the measured weather station data. And what you see is that the risk, the thermal risk is actually very low during the larval growth period in May and June. Very infrequently do uh, does CT max get exceeded and essentially never does the upper lethal temperature get exceeded during that main larval growth period in shade leaves. In sun leaves, there's a little bit more risk, not surprisingly, but the major portion of the risk doesn't really come on until July, which is past the main larval growth period. And so our interpretation is that, again, climate warming will mostly be positive for um, leaf mining caterpillars. It will increase the risk a little bit, but not much. And that actually it looks like the main risk is going to be to pupae later on in the summer. And of course, we haven't done nearly as much thermal work on the pupae. Our Preliminary experiments suggest that their upper thermal limits are a degree or two warmer than those of, of the larvae.
So uh, yeah, offsetting changes, overall improved performance, and maybe some increased risk uh, in the future. Okay, last parting shot, and then I'll stop talking, is that um, I wanna just circle back to this paper of Curtis Deutsch that I talked about in the beginning and say that, um, you know, big analyses like this that make these kind of global statements about uh, how insect performance is going to change almost entirely ignore all of these microclimatic effects that, that we've just been talking about. I think those microclimatic effects are really important. And I think a, a really important next step is to start to do these big global analyses while also accounting for the microclimatic diversity that most insects have available to them. And that's obviously a huge challenge because we would also need information on patterns of microclimates uh, across the Earth's surface. But, but to me, that's one of the really grand outstanding challenges of trying to couple together what we know about insect physiology with what we know about, about climate change. Okay, um, big group of people to thank because this work spanned uh, many years. Um, and I have a bunch of different funding sources that have contributed to this. And I'm sorry I went on so long, but I'd be happy to take um, some questions if we have time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Art, for such an interesting presentation. Um, if I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions, so you can feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or write your question in the chat. Hey, Art, this is Christine. Hi, Christine. Again, <laughs> I, I have um, an in interesting question. Like, so you, you're, you're seeing these micro variations in temperature available to, to the, the insects. Is there any indication of them actually moving around to manipulate? I guess I'm thinking more about the leaf miners because that's where you talked about it in more detail. Yeah. Will they move around to try to track temperatures that are more optimal for processes that? Yep. Yeah, that, that's one of the special things about the leaf miner system is that, you know, the egg, the larva, and the pupa are essentially trapped on the single leaf um, that's chosen by their mom. And so they have really very limited opportunities for behavioral thermoregulation. But you know, other other insects that are larger or more mobile have a, a much more expanded scope for thermoregulation. So like that work we did in in Wyoming on arrowleaf balsam root, we could watch the insects shuttle back and forth between sun and shade. And, oh. and they, you know, just moving a couple of millimeters between those those two kinds of patches, they can they can regulate their temperature by, you know, six or eight degrees. Um, so that that's one of my my sort of key things is like to understand what's, what's the spatial distribution of these microclimates and then how does that interface with the behavioral capacities of the of the insects to, to exploit them. Right. And I guess, I guess the main answer is like, yeah, we got to work on that. It's really interesting. And then the, the, the pupa of the leaf miners, they're just kind of completely stuck in one spot, right? They can't even, cause they're, in like a cocoon kind of thing, is that right? They are, yeah. They just, they're totally stuck. They have to hope for the best. And I think that explains in part why their upper lethal temperatures seem to be so high, right? They're they're not buffered in any way from the extremes. And so they just have to take it. That's because with fish, it's kind of the opposite. We tend to see higher thermal tolerance in the, at least in, in Salmonids in the, the juvenile life stages compared yeah. to the adults. And it, but I think same mechanism is that the juveniles don't have as much ability to move around to to um, to inhabit different temperatures. Yeah, as yeah right, right. Yeah. And and now that you mentioned aquatic habitats, I mean, I think there's a really interesting contrast here between terrestrial habitats where you can get really extreme temperature variation over you know millimeters or centimeters, versus aquatic where the water has so much heat capacity that it's much I think much rarer to get really extreme temperature gradients over over small spatial scales. Right, so they'd have to move a farther distance. Yeah, to, yeah, to take. exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Yeah, thank you.
Yes. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed this talk and um, we need to talk some more. So hi, nice to Great. meet you. Um, Hi, Dan. Diane. Um, so Simone Durney, my graduate student who's listening in as well, uh, is working on balsam root and we're working on a butterfly called Parnassius clodius. Oh, great. And we have warming chambers and we're looking at how the plants respond in terms of flowering and even aborted buds if they don't have quite as a extreme a temperature in the uh, early part of the spring. But the, uh, the butterflies lay their eggs on balsam root in some cases. And one of the other questions we're asking is um, what environmental conditions are controlling the population of Parnassius clodius? And this is basically in the same region where you did your balsam root work. So, um, so we need to talk some more. And Simone, yeah. I don't know if you have any follow up questions, but very, very totally cool. Totally, let's talk. For sure. Yeah, great, great, yeah. awesome. Yeah, thanks for letting me know about that. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, does anyone else have any other questions? All right, well, I encourage the audience to give Art a round of applause. That was such an interesting talk and thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate uh, being invited. All right, talk to you later. Have a good day, everyone.